California, unlike any place in the world, is woven from a diverse fabric of uh, dynamic terroir. Its rolling hills and foggy coastlines, uh, which sit atop unique deposits of rich and bountiful soil, create a cultivation environment unlike anywhere else in the world, which I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, as a licensed distributor based in San Francisco, Philly Green believes in the celebration of these extraordinary appellations. Uh, they strive to be an active voice in the articulation of these incredible stories through community events and their online marketplace. Uh, they believe that more than uh, they can more than educate the market about these vivid cultivation environments, the more loyal their consumer base will grow. Uh, people who consume cannabis want to feel a connection to the land, and these individuals on our panel today are at the forefront of forging those bonds. So a huge thanks for Philly Green and for all the panelists. I'm going to pass it off to Janine Coleman. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Janine Coleman. I'm the director of the Mendocino Appalachians Project, and I'd like to introduce my esteemed panelist. To my left here is the one and only Frenchie Cannoli. <laughs> Woo! Then we have Dan Pomerantz, the CEO and founder of Rebel Grown. Welcome. <laughs> Hezekiah Allen, the chair of Emerald Grown. <laughs> and Dale Hunt, founder of Plant and Planet Law Firm. Welcome all. Um, I'd like to give thanks to uh, Camp Navarro, which is situated in Rancho Navarro. And Rancho Navarro is a countercultural area of historic importance to our community here in Mendocino County. Um, it is a large subdivision. It's a rural residential area that's zoned for agriculture. And they're smaller parcels, and so they're more affordable. And so historically over the decades, it's been a community that really has given uh, the young people, the next generation, and small families their, their start to be able to get their foot in the door to the local uh, economy of Mendocino County. And so, you know, really want to give a shout out to this uh, decades-long historic area that we're enjoying this event in and really acknowledge the importance of these uh, incubator areas to the economic development of rural producing areas like Mendocino County. Thank you. <laughs> want to give a special thanks to Meadowlands. They have been really, really supportive of getting our local community out here and getting the members of our trade associations present and really want to thank you guys. You've been awesome. This is a beautiful event. Thank you so much. So we're going to do a series of introductions, um, and then we have a couple of discussion topics, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about geographic indication systems um, and offer an overview for the, for the panel. So geographic indication systems are a category of intellectual property rights. They collectively belong to the region that's tied to producing and special practices and the product of the region. And Appalachian of Origin is a special kind of geographic indication that's got standards associated with it that really codify and protect the practices, the heritage, and the special genetics of the region. And in uh, California, we've got a few tools now in state law. We've got County of Origin, which is a general geographic indication that's tied to uh, our, co our counties. And then in 2017, the industry uh, lobbied and really advocated to get Appalachian of Origin in California statute with the very special associated standards, practices, and cultivars tied to it. And so right now, we've got uh, those two tools in, in law. And the California Department of Food and Ag will be taking petitions for Appalachian of Origin in 2021. And right now, they're working to develop the regulations to support the program. So we're excited to see this moving forward. Uh, the Mendocino, little hand, yeah, shout out to Cal Cannabis for working on Cannabis Appalachians. They're putting a lot of resources to it, and I think that's a really significant thing for us in this time. It's going to be a really important tool for us moving forward. So the Mendocino Appalachians Project is part of a coalition of regional trade organizations that are working together to realize this tremendous opportunity for standards-based, legally recognized, nationally and internationally recognized Appalachian of origin protections. And we're doing this from the basis of rural uh, economic development and really thinking about sustainability when it comes to our rural economic development. Because this is happening fast. There's a tsunami upon us. And it's very important that as we build policy in a market that we think about rural economic development and doing, doing so in a way that's sustainable. 
So that's a little bit about what I'm working on and the overall topic that we're going to be addressing around genetic resources. And I'm going to go ahead and pass this on so the panelists can introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what y'all are working on. The first time I, um, I heard the word terroir here in, uh, in California was with Tim Blake and uh, Leo Stone from Aficionado. And because I'm French and it's part of my culture, it resonated really strong. And I started to study it because as, par as much as it's part of my culture, I didn't really know very much about it. For us in, uh, in Europe, every agricultural product that has a certain degustative aspect, the value of it is the, the origin of the place. And the whole, literally the whole country of France, it's based on the standard of appellation d'origine and appellation d'origine of quality that give the maximum uh, protection for the farmer and uh, uh, protection internationally and bring your the name of that little farm in the middle of nowhere to a to a world uh, to the world view and every standard that are made are dedicated solely to create that quality and get greater than that so the word appellation d'origine it's internationally protected. You have to follow certain standards to the letter that have been given from uh, by France. So you have the choice here in California. Or you do like the American wine and you create your own classification for cannabis and you have to make it so good that the rest of the world, when they legalize, they want to follow your standard and your regulation and your classification because it's it like they did for the for the wine or you follow the the appellation d'origine standard the wine industry didn't do it because they needed to create their wine industry they needed to have no limitation so that they could create the amazing wine that you have today you don't have that problem. You have so much diversity, so much quality, so much uh, microclimate that you need literally to uh, define it and, um, and classify it because it's so rich. So you need basically those limitations to, uh, to understand what you have. My whole worry all that time was, how can we prove that there is a cannabis terroir, actually? And during my study, in, uh, there is a French government website that tells you everything you need to know about appellation d'origine and control. A lot is in English. And they made me realize that actually there is even Bordeaux was recognized as a terroir because the wine coming from Bordeaux were recognized worldwide for their quality. So you don't have to prove that you have a cannabis terroir. The world over know that you're growing the best quality. Now you need to define the terroir. And defining a terroir goes beyond defining a region. If you grow a so-so quality cultivar in Bordeaux, it will not get an appellation d'origine. If you grow the greatest quality of cultivar, but in the wrong uh, part of Bordeaux, it's not considered an appellation d'origine. It's not everywhere in Bordeaux that is a, a terroir. It's certain parts that are terroir. So the, the art problem, the art uh, labors that you have, it's to define all those amazing terroirs that you have. And then it's like every ag agricultural product. It's like, it's like wine, except that in the wine industry, they have 20, 30 cultivars. You have thousands of them. And it makes things more complicated, but it makes you so much richer in the amount of terpen or what you can bring on the table. And on top of that, every, every one of your farm when you work with living soil and you really use 
the whole beneficial life force of, your, of where you grow is going to make your produit different than the neighbor. Then you can go even deeper. You are recognized for that uniqueness of your, that specific genetics that is pro, gro, grown on your farm. And that's, that's the name of the game. It's like, I've, I've lived in many producing countries. What you have here, it's amazing, and you don't know how much how much you, uh, you are worth, basically. Uh, hey, everyone. Yeah, so first of all, you know, I really appreciate being invited to speak on this panel. Um, it's kind of an honor. I've, I've done some public speaking, but none. This is kind of like the white collar cannabis event. And so, you know, I'm kind of coming in and representing uh, people who work with the plants, the growing community, um, small craft farmers from the Emerald Triangle, and people who are really dedicating their, their lives to breeding work. Um, I'm a little slow recovering this morning, but so let's talk about and touch on some of the things that Frenchie was talking about, which is what is the purpose and the origin of, of these Appalachians? And in Europe, where they came from is really the small craft farmers. So in Romania and France, in certain regions where they were producing a wine or a varietal of grape that was famous and was starting to make their names famous, and then all of a sudden, larger producers started saying, I want to get in on that. I want to produce that Pinot Noir. I want to produce what this little microclimate in Romania is doing. I want to produce uh, champagne. And those small communities that were not rich, wealthy farmers, they were small family-run businesses, said, how can we possibly compete against these massive scale operations that can just demolish us in, in terms of efficiency and cost of production? And so, you know, this goes back what, he, he probably knows more of the history, but 100, 150 years, they worked with their governments to establish themselves and say, look, we started this, we are the originators of this. The process of how we grow these grapes and what's in our unique atmosphere, microclimate, and our soils, this is champagne. You can't get anything like this. You can replicate it, um, but it'll never be the same. And that has to have some intrinsic value of being an originator and putting in decades and decades of, of work. So in California, Northern California especially, I grew up on the East Coast and I was an indoor grower. And, you know, I loved smoking outdoor weed because of the unique terpenes. But, you know, there's, there's really no comparison. When I came out my first season in Humboldt, I was still iffy. I'm like, yeah, this is amazing, but I kind of wish we had some lights, you know, to show you kind of what I can do. After that first season, my life was changed. I was completely blown away about what the environment can actually do, the intensity of the sun, the, the balances in the coastal versus inland microclimates, the elevation. And it was really life-changing just seeing how incredible and how diverse cannabis can be at all these spectrums because of these unique areas. And then over the years, as I started traveling and doing consulting work or meeting different farms, I've been able to see genetics similar and unique grown in all these different areas. So Humboldt County alone is the size of a lot of small states. So just in southern Humboldt alone, you know, the east or west side of the 101 represents a dozen or so little microclimates. Some of them are more coastal. Some of them are closer to the redwoods and are just above a temperate rainforest. Some of them go way too far out and they're dry. But you can see and taste the difference in the flavors and terpenes and resin production between all those different regions. And same with Mendocino. And I think that uh, I, I have a pretty good palate. I smoke a lot and have seen herb produced. And so there's unique things to say about what are some of the textures that resonate to me that are similar whenever I see herb from Bell Springs versus Island Mountain versus Laytonville versus Compshee versus Burnt Ranch. And the deal is, it's, it's really something unique. And in California, right now, everybody is competing over this market share, which is eventually gonna be really big for California. But the reality is that California cannabis has something really amazing to offer the entire world. That's, that's the value. California originates culture. You know, besides, you know, San Francisco and tech, but we have Southern California, where I've only ventured to a few times, is there's 20 million consumers down there. And those types of people, they need education about this. So what's happening is a lot of people want to get in and they want to make money because they think that cannabis is going to be a business where they can just get in and, and make money. But there's folks who preserved the way by taking a lot of substantial risk and devotion and determination for years. And the Appalachians of origin is a way to potentially protect and preserve the way of life for those folks. What's happening is there's massive scale commercial production in Southern California huge and there's some really nice microclimates there's green belts in santa barbara where they grow certain varietals of wine um, so i think that the balance for 
Appalachians in Northern California is really establishing not just the microclimates and the difference in between what varietal grows best in what area or what farm grows them and for what reasons, but also the stories behind those regions. Because just like in Champagne, you know, I have an associate of mine who has an artisanal wine imports business. So two months ago, he was in Champagne, met with small farmers, and was able to tour these facilities where they've been passed down for multiple generations. And these are not wealthy people. They live in small houses. They work their own, you know, they, they work their own grapes. Um, and then their village, it's like a church, a little store, and then a community processing facility where they have these cooperative models. So these champagne producers, they all share time about, you know, they can all make their grapes and or their wine in different processes and store them. But the only way that they could ever survive is by, you know, communally kind of sharing that whole operation. Um, and those are folks, they've never had that champagne ever distributed more than 30 miles from where it was grown. You know, so a friend of mine, his, his company goes and meets those farmers and brings it over to the U.S. That's what California's model needs to be for the future because I know that in my neighborhood, the Palo Verde, we have some very, very special sacred energy from like the Native Americans to the early homesteaders to the cannabis that's grown. And I picture people in Tokyo buying a quarter ounce of that stuff in 10 years from now and going, you can't get this anywhere else and when you hear the story behind it and who produced it and why it's it's the most sacred thing in cannabis so that's why i think something like this is is really important because you know what matters are the producers and the consumers everything in between is a part of the process but the producers are the creators and the consumers are the ones ingesting this and they're the ones who need the education and to know about the importance of all these things so um, that's just a, a little bit, man, I was really excited to participate in this and I wish that we had a lot more than just one hour. And then the genetic side of it is another huge, huge thing because, you know, who, where are your genetics coming from? What, what is in them? How did they get to be what they are? And again, that is one of the greatest stories of cannabis because, you know, it originally started with some land race varietals somewhere that had been growing maybe for thousands and thousands of years and over millennia of, you know, nomadic tribes traveling and bringing seeds to, you know, the modernization of cannabis and all the, the you know, hybridization. It's, it's, it's kind of like over the last 70 years, there's never been an opportunity to understand any of that, to do medical research. It's been too illegal. The people who were paving the way with breeding back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, they ha had such restrictive laws and law enforcement that they couldn't document most of their work. So now, Modern day cannabis breeders are up against massive challenges in terms of the preservation of these genetics and how to apply science and weave in and out. So it's really intense times for the cannabis industry. Exciting, intense. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, if you look at the end of prohibition of alcohol, you know, it didn't just settle right away to the point where there's five or six conglomerates that bought up all the companies. I mean, there were tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people making their living through some type of bootlegging, being involved in alcohol, that transition took decades to settle into, you know, an industry. So this is a really amazing historical time for cannabis. Um, and especially for Northern California, we have something really special to offer to the world. And I think it's really important that we find a way to represent that properly, you know, and present it well so that it can have the impact that it needs to so that our industry doesn't die out and go to a bunch of greedy corporations and massive scale commodity producers who really only care about money at the end of the day. So that's a little take for me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Hezekiah Allen. Uh, it's good to see you all. I know Janine did a great job, but thank you, Meadowlands. Thank you, Meadow, uh, for getting us all together again out here. Um, been working on this project called Emerald Grown. I'm sure a handful of you are familiar with Emerald Grown. Um, started it back in late 2014. Um, our first meeting properly turned into a group therapy session where a bunch of friends and neighbors were admitting to each other they were growers for the first time ever. There were a fair amount of tears, a lot of laughter, and at the end of the day, um, I think we were stronger for it. Um, at the time, we were, you know, sort of just dusting off our, I, I was born and raised, born at home, raised off the grid in Southern Humboldt. My grandparents uh, started growing in Pennsylvania in the 60s, yada, yada. Been a grower all my life. And so we were really just starting to sort of pick our heads up and realize what life off the hill was going to look like, acknowledging the future was coming and that it was time to be a part of it, um, you know, if we're not a part of it, we're not going to be a part of it, I think, simply put. So, um 
evolved from there into realizing that a lot of what we wanted to do was still illegal. Um, you know, Salatin has that book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, something to that effect. It still is, and it definitely still was in 2014. Uh, you know, Frenchie and Dan mentioned the cooperative models of the old world and the wine industry. We couldn't form co-ops. Uh, we actually, you know, weren't allowed. Agricultural co-ops are common in California, but we couldn't form them. And so there were a handful of things we identified coming out of those series of meetings that became the advocacy platform that, that we advanced uh, in the Capitol over the last few years, Appalachians being one of those four pillars. Regulation is agriculture, uh, sustainability, sort of the, the basic core tenets that, that we decided make our community what it is. Uh, I'm pretty pleased to say that we checked off all of those boxes um, on our policy goals. That's not to say that the regulations are something that I celebrate as being finished, <laughs> good, or even bearable at this point. It is to say that when, uh, I don't know if any of you have, you know, Luke Bruner used to be around at a lot of these meetings. The first meeting uh, that Luke and I, we were not invited to the meeting with Senator Correa. We elbowed our way in and they said, this is a closed meeting, you have to leave. And I said, no, we read the law, this is the Capitol, we're allowed to be here, this is the people's government. That meeting was proposing the Board of Pharmacy would issue 30 licenses statewide, mandatory vertical integration. So while it's not great, just think of how far we've come from, that was July of 2014. That was about five years ago. Um, so to be here talking about this topic and talking about what we can do together, the bottom line, what we've been discovering, at least what I've been discovering through this process of catharsis, um, is that we, we genuinely are stronger together. And being able to work together is, is probably the most important thing we can do. Um, you know, and so hence Emerald Grown, uh, it is a federation of cooperatives. Cannabis cooperative associations are capped at four acres each. We are aggregating several of those co-ops through this model, you know, locally owned facilities. I uh, haven't announced this publicly yet, but we do now own three acres of commercial property just north of Laytonville, where the first Long Valley Center will be built out. And then Nevada County, uh, we have a facility out there that we're, we're working on build out, sort of to serve as those first hubs. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. I, I, I applaud all of you licensees that have made it through this on the first wave, let me tell you what. Um, and you know how this all ties into our conversation today, obviously marketing is a huge part of our future going forward. So we've organized our marketing strategy into five pillars. You know, we're going to have a very strong house brand um, and Emerald Grown will be on products at every price point on every shelf in about three years, I think, is what we'll ramp up to. We'll see. Um, but one of the one of the, the the brand pillars that we have is the regional brands. And, and this is an adventurous, playful marketing effort. It is a welcoming hand taking you on the adventure of your lifetime into the middle of nowhere in California, these most beautiful beaches where you can find the solitude, these most bustling of urban areas where you can find the culture. We need to be a guide. We need to welcome and invite people into this experience. But we need to do it in a way that's open and inclusive. Because the beautiful thing about Appalachians to me and about the their shared assets, I am unabashedly a socialist. It's no surprise that these programs largely developed in socialist countries where quality of life matters. The idea of taking something from France, there's so many policies in France that would be so unpalatable um, in, in the US economic system. But the more that we can cross-pollinate between our market-driven system and the common good that is more common in European social democracies, the better humanity is going to be, in my opinion. And so this idea of... <laughs> Thanks. This, yeah, right. Yay, humanity. Go us. We don't totally suck yet. Um, sorry. It's worth like 30 years until civilization goes away if we don't do better. So let's just keep that in the back of our minds while we're building our cannabis industry, that we're not just building our cannabis industry. I think that we're building a beacon of hope for the broader world if we do it right. And so, you know, the, the, these are shared assets. That's the common point. Nobody owns 
Mendocino. Nobody owns Bell Springs. These are all of ours. We've built them together, and it is our responsibility, and it is an incumbent on us to manage them together and to share the benefits of those things equitably. You know, right now, unfortunately, we're doing this panel at the same time as equity. To me, this conversation is about equity. How do we manage shared resources is about fairness and equity. And to try to privatize those things, to try to make them mine, is unacceptable. And it's a moral travesty, tragedy that we all need to call bullshit on and we all need to be better than that. So I know <laughs> I, I know that, that we didn't come here necessarily on this Saturday, Sunday, damn it, Sunday, <laughs> Sunday weekend in the woods to, to like hold our feet to the fire, but it is how it is in my life. Um, feet to the fire. We need to manage these assets together. We need to do better and be better. And I am excited to be a part of that with all of you. Um, I'm Dale Hunt. I was. I just want to start by saying I was excited to be on this panel before I heard all of this, and it's it's just an honor to be on this panel with everybody here. Uh, um, I uh, started as a botanist. I um, somebody told me in college that I couldn't consider myself educated unless I'd had a biology class, and botany fit in my schedule, so I took botany. And after three sessions, it was so fascinating to me. I changed my major, and I I never looked back. I had no good reason to take botany, but I loved it so much. I uh, that was my major. So, um, and then I stuck around for a master's degree in plant genetics, just because I didn't have anything better to do. And then I uh, I went to UC San Diego to do a PhD in molecular and cell biology, which I did also in plants. Uh, and by then I knew I didn't want to be a professor, so I went to Berkeley for law school and became a patent attorney. Um, and even that was a long ass time ago. So um, 23 years ago, I started working as, a, as an attorney in a law firm, and one of our clients was uh, a Central Valley fruit company that made great varieties of stone fruits and, and grape vines, table grapes. And I had the opportunity to help them protect their, their genetics all around the world and not just protect, but commercialize. So uh, I, in addition to that, I did a bunch of other kinds of patents. But uh, I didn't know that I was preparing myself to work in the cannabis industry, but I was. So <laughs> my mission now, really, I, the way I see it is um, the difference. And I've worked with a lot of other uh, plant genetics companies. But the difference between all of those companies and every other Every other company I know that works with plant breeders and this industry is that in every one of those companies, the plant breeders are employees. They're either the founders of the companies, in which case they're doing great, or they're employees. And they sign their assignments of their patent rights, and they, they have fine jobs, but they're employees. And in this, in this industry, they are, I, I, in many cases, they're um, successful entrepreneurs already. But otherwise, they are, um, they're the rebels, they're the outlaws, they're the survivors. But I think they need to be the rock stars. And they are going to be the absolute rock stars of this industry. Um, you know who they are. You know who you are. And um, super creative. This is, the most, this is the plant with the greatest genetic potential of any. We already know that. And, um, but there's one other thing about... Um, about this plant that is, it, this is this is not unique to this plant, but it's it's unusual at least that um, the the patent system. I don't want to bore the hell out of you, but you, I do have to tell you this. This is why I'm here. Um, the patent system for plants is kind of divided between. It was divided three ways. It's divided between plants that you propagate asexually and 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 you know the plants that you clone or plants that you propagate with seeds. And obviously, as you know, with cannabis, you go both ways, right? And so that, that makes it complicated to even know what, how to protect what you're, what you're, uh, what you're doing or which, which kind of IP to get. So I was on the phone yesterday with a friend of mine who was speaking at a, at a uh, cannabis event, a, a patent attorney who was speaking at a cannabis event in D.C., and she said, just give me the short rundown on, on I need to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I said, well, just read the blog I posted last week. And she said, I don't have time. I said, it's five minutes. 
at, at most. She said, just, just give me, just explain it to me quickly. I said, okay, well, first thing you need to know is they might make their money by selling clones or they might make their money by selling seeds or they might just sell harvested material. They might make an extract. And she said, what? <laughs> and, and the kind of IP they get totally depends on what, how they're making their money. I was, okay. And then I said, anyway, we had this whole conversation, and she decided it was way too complicated, and she's just going to send everybody to me, and it's, that's great. But um, one other story I want to tell you. I, um, I have, you know, if you're an attorney, you work in an office a lot. One of my favorite things I ever did was to get out of the office and come up here and meet with one of my clients who's a plant breeder. He has a farm up in Laytonville, way up in the hills. And he sent me back to San Diego with a bunch of samples. And two of my favorite people that I work with are experts at tasting cannabis. And so I brought them back some stuff from here. And it didn't look like the stuff they, they usually get. I think because the stuff they usually get isn't grown outdoors in Mendocino County. And they looked at it. Kind of, they said, oh, this doesn't look like what we usually get. And then they, they started to roll it and said, this is super sticky. And then they smoked it and they said, this is the best stuff we've ever had. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then the next time I went on a road trip, they came with me. <laughs> um, this is just, this is special. This is, being here is special. Um, working with people who, uh, who grow the plant is special. I, I just, I really do feel like it's an honor to be part of this industry. Um, and I'm just glad to be here with you. So let's go. Thank you. Hell yeah. I really want to take the conversation specifically into genetic resources. I think from an Appalachian's perspective, it's really kind of the heart and soul of the designation because it's really the plant and the product where the place, the practices, the, the cultural knowledge behind how the plant is produced and loved and nurtured into a product really expresses through the cultivar. And cannabis is such a responsive plant. It responds so personally to our endocannabinoid system, to the environment that we're cultivating in and our practices. I think it's really kind of the heart and soul of how we differentiate ourselves and, and how these Appalachian of origin designations will come into f bearing fruit for us. Um, and there's a number of um, threats to our biodiversity. Um, real quick, I'd like to see a show of hands for the breeders in the house. There's a lot of people here. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, we wouldn't be here without you, really. So we're facing, you know, first of all, it's an annual plant, right? And so the, the risk to losing our cultivar lines is already high, right, from the start as an annual. And then we're facing um, regional bans where before we had the capacity to cultivate under, um, you know, previous, our previous, you know, regulatory regime. Um, we've got hemp coming forward and that, you know, does pose a risk to our cultivars as we transition rapidly into hemp cultivars. Um, you know, there's a number of things facing really like threatening our genetic resources. And so I think it's important to really contextualize this as, as like the first priority when we're working to really establish our Appalachian of origin protections and really build the tools that we need to meaningful, meaningfully protect our cultivars moving forward. Um, and, you know, to look at the international context, because Appalachian of origin is an international protection, there's a number of ways that um, the world bodies have framed avenues of protection for our work, right? So you look at the World Health Organization and there's international policy tools around um, rights of access to traditional medicine. This is a traditional medicine, right, that we've been really nurturing over the decades, and I think it's really important to remember that. Uh, there's traditional knowledge embedded in the work that we're doing, traditional cultural perspectives um, and expressions, and these are the things that we're protecting. Uh, last year, there was a pretty amazing um, piece of policy that 
was approved by the UN. It's the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other Working uh, People in Rural Areas. And there's specific language in there to protect our genetic resources and recognition about how that's a bedrock of rural economies and agrarian economies. And so I want to put those thoughts forward and understand that we're creating an Appalachian of origin system not for wine, but for a traditional medicine. And so there's a unique perspective and set of considerations that we need to put into this work as we frame these protections, not just for the producers and the consumers, but for the patients, right? Because how we produce our medicine and what genetics we're, we're working with and how those express in the diverse expression of cannabinoids and terpenes that have medical value that we have yet to even really understand has to be at the forefront of how we're building our Appalachian of origin system. So really wanted to um, put some, some love out for the history of, of medical cannabis advocacy and how we've all gotten here over the decades and really give thanks to that aspect of the plant as a, as a healing, <clears throat> healing plant. So with genetic preservation, it's, uh, it's, it's all about the details. So for instance, with plat plant patenting, what you would do is you would characterize these genetics. The big question that we need to figure out is what genetics grow well in specific regions and for what purposes? And that's the thing. There's there's no research into that. You know, there's neighborhoods where someone may have been developing a varietal for, you know, uh, a decade, two decades, three decades. But we don't have the research to know what variety is going to perform better in this coastal environment versus this inland climate and for what reasons. Now we have the farmers are the ones who have that data. So really, man, I, this whole conversation, we should leave politics out of it because this is all about representing the farmers. The farmers are the ones who have this information. They're the ones who have this experience. You know, most farmers were afraid to write down notes. You couldn't keep data records of your yields. You know, I remember being at a poker game where someone was talking about all the records that they have from their harvest and trimming records, and they got laughed out of the room because these guys are like, dude, you're going to, if they raid your house, you're going to get indicted, and they're going to have all this information on all these genetics records. So we used to have notebooks and, you know, have them buried in the woods with, with all the, the trimming records, data collection, analysis on, on breeding and phenotype characterization. We would bury that in the woods and literally have to hike 15 minutes anytime we wanted to see a note on a phenotype the next time we're making a breeding selection round. So the thing is, it's a big discussion of how do we know what varieties are going to grow best in what regions, and it's kind of like this is brand new. We need to bring farmers together and compare notes versus this area versus this area, and uh, you know, there's going to be some science that's going to need to be applied to it, which is a, a very difficult thing for growers to start to get into that notion of applying science to their their intuition, which has come from their instinct and intuitive experience and relationship with the plants. So it's a whole new spectrum. But I think the first part of it is starting to characterize these genetics beyond like, oh, is it indica sativa or a hybrid or it grows like this? We need to get into what are the textures to the, the flavor profiles and the details of the cannabinoids and the terpenes and how do those cannabinoids and terpenes grow in different regions for, for what reasons? And, uh, and beyond that, just characteristic, you know, the, the vigor, the structure, is it symmetrical? Is it elongated? Is there, you know, a redness to the stem? All that needs to be, it's like the next step of cannabis genetics. Um, it's, it's intense and it's interesting because you know, cannabis growers sometimes are, you know, people who keep to themselves and are way out in the hills, starting to interact with attorneys, you know, people who have that experience. I mean, that's the next step is coming together. The problem is when you take people from outside of cannabis, you always need to question their intentions. Why are they doing this and what do they want out of this? And, you know, everybody wants to support their families and make a living. And there is going to be people who come in from outside industries with the intentions of I want to help these people preserve their work. I want to help them do it right, but we also need to be careful for people who are coming into it for the wrong reasons. So yeah, can we talk about trust issues? <laughs> we need to talk about trust, right? Because we got some serious. There's some serious trust problems in. Right. I mean, <laughs> be, before before we go into protecting genetic, you have a pool of genetics that is unique and amazing. The problem is that that pool of genetics are in drawers, and you're growing whatever they're growing down south, which you shouldn't do. So you're growing sun-grown genetic, 
uh, wedding cake and all the stuff that everybody else and his brother is growing, and you're competing with the same genetic with, some, with the indoor. It's not the solution because you have much better. So if you could go back and take what you have in your cupboard and then took all those data of the old good old days and bring back that genetics that created everything that we are actually smoking today and that is weaker than their parents and grandparents and great 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 grandparents you you have something that is unique and it's not really heirloom because you don't let the seeds spend the winter in the uh, in the ground that's you need that you need that full cycle of the genetic if you really want your plant to become heirloom and become the place where it uh, it really grow you need to understand the value of that genetic because like Jenin said, the first things basically that they did in the in the in in wine industry when they created all those appellations is a classification of quality. So that there, when there is a standard of quality, what is the best of the best growing in specific region, in specific farm, then everything else that come into play in your own region have to be able to keep the standard, everything that is not the standard have nothing to do in your territory so that the source of everything is you. I'm so dependent on you, it's silly. I'm like a, a, a winemaker and I shouldn't even have my name on the packaging. The name on my packaging, the hash I made, it's yours. When I was traveling in producing country, nobody cared really much that I made the ash, but they were asking me which valley, which hamlet, which altitude. And this is land race. You have so much more value because beyond the farmer, actually, terroir, it's the land, it's the climate, it's the genetic, but it's more than the farmer. It's the community around the farmer, actually. The farmer is the part of the osmosis, but that community around that farmer is super important for, for the quality, literally, of the product. So it's like you really have to, to realize how valuable you are and how valuable everything you have is and bring it back on the market because that's what makes you different from anywhere in the world and I've been in the quite a few producing countries. Yep. Um, and before we, <laughs> before diving into trust issues, I want to take a minute to, to you know, Frenchy is probably the one of the more, if not the most, traveled hashas scene um, that I know. Um, I've been to a handful of, of these countries too, also in my wanderings, and and it's absolutely true. You know, the the diversity here, the biodiversity, the culture, um, genetics. I agree is step one for the, the fact that there are so many external threats to our genetics. We have to start by protecting what is most threatened, but I, I don't think by any means that genetics stands apart um, from the other elements of what makes good cannabis good. I think microclimate, climate is very important. I think culture, standards, the way that the communities are structured, the way that we share information, the way that we treat ideas, wisdom, and experience as things that can raise everybody as opposed to something to privatize and take. And so, again, it goes back to some of those fundamental questions of how we structure social institutions and how we structure our businesses, you know, when we start to talk about the commercial aspect of it. Um, speaking specifically to genetics, and I don't mean to be terribly doom and gloom, but climate is changing. My, you know, my family's varietal of Afghani that we've localized to our tiny little sliver of the Matol, mid Matol, Honeydew, Dry Creek, upper east branch of the Dry Creek, if we get really technical about it, that Afghani is not growing the same in that watershed as it was when I was 10. 
you know that that's been our family farm family ranch whatever since i was seven it doesn't grow the same there anymore and yeah we're 30 generations deep into it but the climate is changing around us and so there's this impulse that i have to preserve protect and hold and i'm finding myself very often needing to focus on the mantra of adapt evolve and flow as well and they 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 it's nice that it takes so comfortably to our culture but i find sometimes that articulating these things really helps me realize them and bring them into shared space and so we do need to be attentive to the changing conditions around us i know you know just not to bring too much politics in it i know cdfw and the water board are kicking our asses to some degree but it's for a reason and our our culture and our processes need to be adaptable enough to continue to persist i am incredibly thankful that cannabis is so diverse that it expresses itself so many different ways sometimes it's frustrating that it expresses itself so many different ways really wanted those ones to be you know that 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 particular expression and they weren't and that can be a drag etc but we have this very, very, very dynamic core of genetic material, core of experience of narrative and culture, and being able to both hold on to that and preserve it and keep it safe and steward it, be the guardians of it like we've always been, while also acknowledging that the world is changing around us, both regulatorily, commercially, but also just fundamentally climatologically changing. It's a tricky, tricky intersection to be in, but this is the community to be in that crossroads and, and let's let's keep at it. And I didn't mean to derail from the trust conversation. I think it's really critical. I just wanted to mention those few key points. Well, I'm As glad you I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you did. And um, I don't want to have this turn into a, a conversation about trust instead of the topic, sure. but I think it, it ties into the topic because I think cool. protecting genetics um, – there is a need to reassess trust. Um, I'll tell you, one of the first um, in-person client meetings I had uh, with a with a nursery, um, the uh, the person I was meeting with told me that he was evaluating whether to protect any of his uh, any of his uh, cultivars, any of his genetics, and he said that he had one that was pretty valuable that he liked a lot, and he. Um, gave some clones to somebody on kind of a handshake agreement that this guy would pay him uh, per clone. And he never saw any money. He figured that the clones, that, that particular uh, strain just never went anywhere. I'm using strain in the vernacular sense. We can use cultivar. I'm not <laughs> as, as obsessed with that as some people are. Um, and I'm actually going to update my blog about that. Uh, but um, he said that a year later, he saw that very cultivar in a catalog, his buddy's catalog. So he called his friend and said, hey, um, we had a deal. And his friend said, you know, I got, I got employees. I got bills to pay. You know how things are. Uh, sorry. Done. That was the end of the conversation. They didn't have a written agreement. He didn't have any IP protection. And he thought he knew who he could trust, but he, he, was, he made a mistake. Um, things change. Uh, we all know, you know, uh, I, we're not here to rehash phylos, but we know that you think you know who you can trust and then, and then things change. Um, you, uh, if, if you grew up in the, some of my favorite breeders are the ones that grew up, uh, breeding the plant in the seventies and eighties, and you absolutely knew you couldn't trust the government. So the last thing you want to do is trust the government to seek intellectual property protection. But guess what? That's, that's who grants intellectual property protection. So it's time to just kind of reassess. I'm not even, I'm not even going to tell you who to trust. I'm just saying reassess your trust. Think about who to trust. And I think so that's a really great point. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to speak to that really quickly. I don't think it's as much about trust as it is about you know, what are our methodologies in place? What are our filters, right? What are our resources so that we have the education and the understanding, you know, behind what the tools are that we can protect and how to negotiate our contracts. And I want to give a shout out to the trade associations because they're really here to serve you as an industry and aggregate resources and bring that education and that knowledge base to support your efforts in protecting your IP, developing your appellations, and also navigating contracting. I mean, 
who of us, you know, had so much experience with contract law, you know, prior to five years ago, right? So there's a whole <coughs> cultural transition in place and really looking to our local associations as the bedrock to navigate and negotiate policy, um, contracts, resources, research, you know, and looking, really uh, doing our due diligence as individuals and as communities and through our associations to really vet, you know, what the tools are and the filters through which we're pursuing our research and our data aggregation and our ownership. And so, you know, to that point, I think is, is a really important thing to keep in mind as a resource and really support, um, you know, your community through your trade associations. Right. So, so that's good. There's a lot of good knowledge here. I respectfully agree with half of that. I disagree with the other half. And, <laughs> and I just wanted to say that Hezekiah's point on climate change is a really important factor because I've only been in California for 10 years, 11 seasons that I've seen fall harvests of, and I've seen drastic changes in the way that varieties perform. You know, and, and every season is, is different. If you have a hot September, two years ago, it was 95 plus degrees in my neighborhood for 21 days in September. So we have a delayed ripening, you know, so the plants think that it's the middle of the summer again. So there, that's that's a real challenge to to consider. In terms of the, the local trade organizations, look, when someone starts devoting their time to something, there's a purpose. It's either a selfless purpose of giving back or they want something out of it. It can be both. And so the thing is, I think for those trade organizations who want both, like Hezekiah grew up in Southern Humboldt. So I'm trying to preserve the community in Southern Humboldt where I'm still a transplant. You know, it's like I finally own my own place. It's my dream. But I still consider myself an outsider because there's people who sacrificed way longer than I have. So with these trade associations, there needs to be more inclusion of the farmers because how many of the farmers actually have the information and how many of the people in the trade association association know all the information? But anyway, just go into the fun part and talking about plants and genetics and preservation because I thought it would be a lot more fun to talk about weed and growing weed on this panel than, than you know all the, the politics and trade associations. So genetic preservation for the future in terms of the breeding or Pre, you know, preservation of genetics, it's really, it's really two forms. One is through seed production and selection and, and breeding programs, which is, that's what I spent a lot of my time daydreaming of since I was a little kid and, you know, really like to get into and, and love to speak about. And the other is through clone propagation and preservation. However, when you look at what's happening with the clones, like when you mentioned wedding cake, it's like something becomes a popular variety, the market gets hot, everybody gets it, it gets really oversaturated, uh, people don't take good care of their mothers, you know, and so there's always like the next greatest thing. So I think it's really special when you find the varietals that have been, like you said, your family's been working genetics for 30 years. The people who started bringing, you know, different Afghanis into these regions when people just used to grow sativas that would come in their bag seed that was shipped over by the megaton from South America and Colombia and it never finished in time. But in terms of clonal propagation, we now face all these new challenges with, with pests and pathogens and disease. If you compare it to other industries, I think the banana industry is a really good comparison where there's like 10,000 varietals of bananas, but we only use three of them because most of them don't store well. They have to be shipped and transported across all these countries. And what happened, I believe it was in the 80s or 90s, I'm no expert, I may be completely uh, misspeaking, but basically a plant virus and pathogen wiped out a ton of the commercial produced banana varieties. So what Americans were eating as bananas in the 50s is not what we eat as bananas because that species pretty much doesn't exist anymore. It, it basically got taken out by a pathogen. So for the clones that we have, um, from the time that I showed up, all these pests, you know, powder mildew, russet mites, root aphids, and now, you know, unidentified plant pathogens and viruses are now present in our environment, which is also due to global warming. So before I came here, I'd only seen powder mildew once. Most of my neighbors had never seen powder mildew. I, I heard when they first started seeing it, they thought they were crystals on, on the weed, you know? And if you look, there's a, there's a university study out of, out of Mendocino from like 2011, 2012, that each year, the spore count for powder mildew is dramatically increasing every single year in the environment. So farmers have to be smarter about how to prevent that and combat that by using, you know, organic microbiology and living soils. Uh, but the pathogens, pathogens are really the biggest risk because just... Uh, you know, let me uh, think of how to phrase this. So basically all these clones that we grow, they stay in people's mother rooms, people go through different treatments. Even with some of the best organic practices, you can't, you can't prevent against certain bacterias. 
And so it's really important for us to start working with science and thinking about micropropagation, which is essentially tissue culture, where we can bank these genetics. What can happen with technology is people can clean the genetics. For instance, I, I love sour diesel. I've been growing it since 2002, like back in the East Coast. And uh, it's an old clone. It's been around since the 90s. OG Kush is from the early 90s. Uh, any grower in here who's grown an SFV clone, it's not fun or easy to grow because it's been passed around. You don't know where it came from. And imagine what's gotten into it in terms of pathogen, disease, and, and viruses. With tissue culture propagation, you can take that SFV clone. It can be completely wiped clean, remove all the bacteria, essentially disinfecting it. And then when you get those back in tissue cultures, whether it's a mother or clones for propagation for, for your cultivation, it's clean. It's like growing a seed for the very first time ever. So, so it's basically going to be through seed production and proper preservation of breeding practices in terms of keeping things preserved, but also maintaining the diversity that's in the genetics, which is a very long conversation. And then in terms of clones, starting to work with micropropagation applications. So even if they're not going to be grown out, you don't need to keep all these mothers around. And we can start every year producing, you know, tissue culture mothers that start out with a clean slate. Um, there's someone in Northern Humboldt that's been doing a lot of research on these pathogens, and he showed me these graphs from field research starting in 2009 through the present time. And he started with a few areas where he would, you know, test the tissue samples. And basically, you find these stunted, you know, uh, clones that basically take two or three weeks to get to get healthy to the point where you can actually grow them eff effectively. And really talented growers find themselves outgrowing this virus, outgrowing this pathogen by applying you know, good beneficial microbiology and, and good sustainable organic soils and, and practices like that. But it's still there. When you get a clone from somebody back, I don't know, man, like nine out of 9.999 out of 10 times, the clone has issues. And so this guy's research has actually shown that he's discovered a virus. And you can see on a graph, we're starting in 2010, you know, he found it on a few samples. In 2011, he found more. And then each year, by 2012, 2013, it was in every single sample of tissue that he took from clones of cannabis plants from all around the Emerald Triangle between my area, Island Mountain, all over Mendocino and Trinity. Um, so in terms of preservation, I do think we need to we need to go to some greater minds from the scientific community and, and work collaboratively so that we don't lose clone genetics. Because anybody who's a grower or breeder in here has probably lost something special to them that you'll never get back, like a last of the Mohican variety. And uh, it's really important for the future to be able to preserve that. So I thought it'd be more fun to talk about weed and, and growing weed. hundred <laughs> percent. Thank you. Well, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end, and I wanted to go ahead and open it up to the audience if you have questions. Shoot. Hi, Anne Delane from Dewpoint Farms in Humble. Um, we lost our mother room a couple years back due to human error, and it was a tragedy. But then it opened up the conversation with my father-in-law, who had been breeding in the Atoll Valley um, for the last two decades. And he was like, oh, yeah. I think I have some seeds somewhere. I'm like, what? I'm talking about the drawer. Uh -huh. There's a coffee can buried somewhere. Um, those in 2021. And my question is legally, like, what's the first step of, of protecting? Can you, can you repeat the question on the mic? So, so your, your question was ahead. legally, what's the first step of protecting all those seeds? Those genetics that my father-in-law has been using. You know, that's a great question, and um, I'm going to start with this. A lot of people wonder if what they have is unique enough to protect. And um, the, the easiest answer is every single, every single seed you ever plant is unique enough to protect. Just, and that might sound crazy, um, but, you know, um, no matter how many children my parents had, unless they're twins— we're all different. We're all unique enough to be different, right? To be protectable. The question is, are we worth protecting, right? Um, and so um, the real question is, if you have something that, if you have a seed, if you have a plant that you've grown up, um, is it worth commercializing? Does it, and not just, is it going to be worth uh, commercializing for more than a few seasons? Uh, if it's going to be worth commercializing for more than a few seasons, then you want to protect it. And then the question is, are you likely to, to make your money selling clones, selling seeds, or just selling harvested material? If you're going to sell flour and you're never 
ever going to need to sell plants, sell, never sell any kind of propagating material, you could, if you were positive that no genetic material would ever slip out of your control, you wouldn't even need intellectual property protection. Of course, nobody's ever positive that that's going to happen. But if you're, if you're never selling clones or seeds, the best thing to do, the, the easiest, cheapest thing to do is get a plant patent. That's like a copyright on a plant. It's, it's really not that hard to get. You don't have to have DNA. You don't have to have a whole lot to get started. You need a couple photos of the plant. You need um, a name that isn't your trademark name. Um, what's, and, what's the cost on that? Uh, to get started, it costs, uh, I don't, yeah. That's, that's so hard. it's likely not <laughs> worth the cost currently. What, what I would recommend that you guys do, if it's important as a family heirloom, Grow it out and do an open pollination and make the next generation of seeds, but do the whole thing. All the males, all the females, call out the weaker ones. That way you have it. And as your family continues to grow it, and, and if it's special to you and you keep it preserved, over time the, the need and value to protect the IP will, will come. That'll happen if you prove it in market. But if it's just sacred for your family, open pollinate it, preserve it, store those seeds properly, do it before it's too late and you can't get them to germinate. Maybe take some clone selections, and we've all lost stuff due to human error. You know, it's like, man, if you want something right, do it yourself. But, but that's what I would say. Keep it within your family. Reproduce those seeds so you have the next generation. Open pollinate, you know, cull out any of the weaker plants. And then if it proves value in the market, at some point when people are starting to come for you to find it, then talk to some lawyers. Then look into protecting the IP. It's, it's too early to do that. Can they ask the next and, I, and I completely oh. agree. You, you don't want to spend money on IP until you know that you've got something valuable. The only thing is, um, if you're losing control of if you're losing control of the genetics, that's when you it may already be too late. Just just be careful about that part. Can you? I have the next question because it's related. How can you patent a plant that is on Schedule One? That that didn't. I didn't get the last part. How can you patent a plant that is on Schedule 1? Ah, this is great. Oh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is not concerned at all about legality or even safety. They leave that to other agencies. <laughs> They've been granting patents on illegal and unsafe things throughout their entire history. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So Great news. With plant <laughs> patents, it's kind of like... Plant patents is like this, all right? Here's the real deal. Like, if you're a grower, it's like, who can own a plant? You know, it's like, that's how I feel about, you know, all of this stuff. It's like, what is your entitlement to owning this? Like, when I first owned land, I never thought that I would. So I was like, man, I own this land. And then I, I went to it and I stood there and I go, I don't own this land. You can't own a land. You can't own land. You know, it's my job to steward, preserve it. But just like like the Native Americans and, and you know, cultures throughout civilization, it's like, if it's part of nature, can we really own it? And then as you start to create and adapt things that are more unique to you that you've put effort into, then you start getting there. But I just think with plat you know, with patenting stuff, I mean, it's, like I said, all of this is a new, intense discussion, you know, but I think I'm, it's too early for, for cannabis. And unless it's really proving an application in market and there's a risk of it being infringed on. I'm going to respectfully just point out that um, people, you don't own land because it, land is going to be there long after you're gone. But people do build fences around their land. They, they stop people from building roads across their land. They stop people from moving on to their land. That's exactly what a patent is a boundary Boundaries. around what you've created so that you're free to do what you want to do with what you've created. And you can you can allow people to come onto your land and to even live on it, to have parties on it, whatever. But if you don't exert control over your land, it's not your land anymore. Um, by the same token, if you create some great uh, variety you're free to do what you want with it. But as soon as you utterly lose control of that, it's not really yours to decide anymore. And if you get a patent, and I'm not, it, absolutely, there, most things that are, that are ever created are not worth patenting. But if you ever have something that really is worth patenting and you don't patent it, you will lose your opportunity to, to be the one that controls its destiny, its fate. So um, that's like not putting a fence around your land. I'm going to thread a middle line here if I could. Um, That's why you're in the middle. I think we need to prevent other people from patenting. Your stepfather, I think, happens to be the source of my family's Afghani from, from several decades ago, coincidentally. Not to, we grew up very close to one another. And so 
I think we need to stop somebody else from saying, no, this is mine. You can't have it. We need a way. I mean, and I'm obviously a broken record. I'm really good at getting into obsessive, obsessive grooves. And my obsessive groove currently is cooperative. Cooperative ownership. We, I agree. We can't own nature. It's a silly concept. It's part of why things are so screwy in the world today. Um, we need to do a better job of asserting our responsibility to these variety, varietals and our guardianship of them. Um, actually owning it is very costly and agree entirely with both of them that like it's too soon we don't know but to start establishing benchmarks and lines in the sand around these shared assets around these things that these courageous heroes brought to us from you know these land rate like this is a very real community asset and and figuring out where to set the balance between the individual and the community and you know to sort of Frenchie's opening comments it's not just the farmer it's the community around the farmer and that to me is why i'm a broken record <laughs> no, so, so another so, question so from he, the audience so what he said i think was really really valuable information is the main purpose of why people should protect is who's going to steal it from you and who's going to take it from you and you're really correct on that because so you know the guy who didn't show up today and all the controversy with that i i was really hoping he was going to show up i was going to be very respectful but i was going to really drop some some knowledge for sure and so the deal is the roots of that go very deep it, this didn't just happen with this phylos thing in the last six months or in the last year that organization and that entity started in 2009 2010 they had robert clark and sam the skunkman went on to these online forums of of cultivators and started asking to collect people's genetic specimens of land race local varietals even in seed form that they thought couldn't germinate they still wanted that for what they were calling a worldwide classification program and this is all documented you can find it all online so phylos was involved in all of this back in the day and then my question was, who's paying for this? Because this is some really forward-thinking technology. So who's who's putting up the money for that? And if you really start diving, I mean, I don't care that much, but if you really look into it, there's ties between executives at GW Pharmaceuticals to that whole structure of entities at that time that was really ahead of everyone being like, look, let's just get as much genetic information as we can into our pockets so that we can hopefully be the ones to start adapting biopharmaceutical products. Because that's the, the whole thing when you think about the forward future of the industry. We are going to learn certain cannabinoids and terpenes that we don't even understand yet in combinations might cure diseases. They might have incredible medical applications that can better humanity. But it's going to be biopharmaceutical, geoengineering. That's, those are the companies who have the applications and the ability to do that. And so it's just it's a very mixed thing about how I feel the emotions. But in terms of people who want our genetics, all of the biggest agricultural companies in the entire world, Bayer, Sygenta, Monsanto, Cargill, every one of them, you know, when people talk about, oh, Marlboro, Philip Morris is buying up land, people talked about that 20 years ago, and they were probably doing it. It's not a conspiracy. They're smart, forward-thinking, massive conglomerates that control, control the whole world, you know, on some conspiracy stuff. So that is what we do need to protect ourselves from, and it's like, those people are coming into this industry. They're doing it. They've been doing it. They've been doing it for over a decade. They were smart and they stayed real silent. Now some of it is bubbling up, but who knows where they've been in investing and in, in figuring out. And then the thing is, can growers like us, can we do all that stuff without joining them? Because it's like, you don't want to join them. If you can't beat them, do you have to join them? We don't know yet. But it, that's that's the conversation in terms of protecting our genetics, which was really smart. It's like it's too early for us to go there. We don't have the funds, but we need to make sure that someone else doesn't steal your family's life's work because there's people already trying to do things like that. All right, so we're going to impose a lightning round rule for Janine's sake. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, so let's take another question from the audience, and let's go with Frank. Um, I'm going to make it short. So what about the idea of a collectivized and tissue culture bank that everybody basically owns on a non-profit level. That's the way to do something to preserve these genetics. The, the only way to really preserve oh, the Frenchy, hold on. Um, paraphrase the question for the video, okay. folks. Um, is there a way to collectively, or broken record, cooperatively own a seed and genetics bank? It's like if Philo had put all the data they had taken from everything that was given to you available for the public, then it's okay yep. to share. 
but everybody has access to it. Then it's really worthwhile because, like, like Ezekiel said, and you say it's way that plant is way beyond possessing it while you need to protect your, yourself. So dealing with an entity that puts it available to the public, it's a big deal. I take it personally because Robert Clark, that I respect a lot, asked me to ask you to give sample. Sam the Skunk Man sent me DM personally to ask you, Mowgli, ask me to ask you personally. And I love you to death and I need you like nobody else, but I cannot give, I, I cannot trust to that level. It's like I cannot give my word and take something from you that I know is, is so precious and give it to an entity when I'm not sure that those data are available for everybody. Uh, yes, um, there absolutely is. It wasn't a planted question, I swear, but it might as well have been. Um, our dear colleague Casey isn't here. He had a wedding to go to, but you know, one of the first things that Casey did back in 2014 with Emerald Grown were a mutual benefit, meaning all of our assets can only be used for the common benefit of all of the mem members, was start a seed bank and a free open swap and exchange seed bank. It has been a tough time for growers the last couple of years. We've been about as spread thin as we can be. I think we're turning the corner on that and I think we're moving into an era where we will have the capacity to formalize some of these institutions. Looking forward to talking to the colleague here about how those types of cooperative ownership structures might help serve us, but, but making sure that our community protects our common assets from the oncoming threats is, I I think the bottom line and, and your question is spot on. Yes, there is a way to structure that. Yes, there is a way to do that. I think it's really important that um, it's possible to collectivize individual uh, IP assets and put them into a pool that can be asserted as a defense if anybody gets uh, taken on by Big Ag that the collective could kind of um, form a counterbalance. And I, I think that's an important... Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. And, you know, to your point around trade associations, I think, you know, just like any partnership, right, if you're working with a company, you're working with um, an institution, you're working with trade associations, it's about standards, right? Standards of how we do business, standards of what our agreements are. And I think it's up to all of us to do our due diligence and really follow the money. You know, where is the money coming from? How are we evaluating this data uh, moving forward and, and how is that piece coming back to the community and so I think that is everyone's individual job to really do that due diligence and really look at you know who we're partnering with and really what are what are the tools we're working with and where's the balance of um, how we're exchanging resources in that context so um, we're about 20 minutes over time and so we can keep it going. We're, we're down to we're down to keep going no one's telling us to get out of here so let's go ahead and with with one more question I, I think that um, it's not even a question because we're talking about trust um, my name is Fiona Ariaga. I work for Kaplan Murphy up in Utah, California and just taking it down to the farm level and cost you know like talking about data so many farms that I work with and have other distributors they don't share COAs you should definitely lean on your partners. Like, if you have a distributor, let them cover those costs for you. Everything is costly. Like, work with people who will cover those costs and work with those distributors who share those results back to you. So, you, you already have terpene analysis. You have all these COAs that you can start compiling, compiling data. And I know it's a scary thing, again, going like, what are they going to do with that data? All these things. But you have to have COAs. Use that data for knowledge and start there when you're compiling it. And don't accept no for an answer. Have these people partner with you. He's got a Thank question you. up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're calling him. Yeah, so, this is kind of also more of a comment. Um, Send your own bits. <laughs> but it's also more in your wheelhouse, man. Um, I think we need to look into participatory plant breeding programs. There's a lot of data on this, there's a lot of information out there. If you look it up, PPVs, they're awesome. We need the Farmers Association, the farmers, to get together with the Appalachia groups. We need those cultivars that you've got to get in and protected in the Appalachians of origin as our cultivars. 
as historical representations of what we're trying to protect. Even if we can't get it into the patent system, and even if that's not necessarily the greatest value added or you know money proposition, we need to figure out multiple strategies that start with farmers, working with local breeders, collecting all that data, and using our local trade associations and like all this, we need to get over differences. Like there's all sorts of camps going back decades in the cannabis world. We fight incessantly and we gotta get over that shit because Dale's article was incredibly what like, on point. Thank you. Big ass coming and we got to Thank you, Thank you Trevor. <laughs> Tony. I agree. Can you restate the question so they can all hear? Yeah. yeah, she was, oh man, it's a lot of, it's a lot of question, but she was saying, <laughs> you know, how can we develop those processes of getting the communities and the farms together with some of the, uh, some of the organizations or companies that actually have the resources or assets to help collect all this data and use it responsibly to benefit everyone in the right ways with positive intentions. And I think it's already happening. This discussion is a part of this. Your organization, which has done really amazing work and come up into my neighborhood and gotten people to show up at the firehouse who like would never even consider showing up at a meeting like that. So it's, it's about dialogue, reaching out to each other and connecting. And that's the thing about weed is like weed culture used to be like you had to be down. Now everybody thinks everybody they're in thinks it and they're not, you know? <laughs> but so... It's, a, it's definitely about a dialogue. The folks who have the resources and the assets need to reach out to the communities or the leaders of those communities, you know? And, and that's it, man. It's a dialogue, a discussion, and starting more meetings and, and organizations because that's one of my missions. There's so much crazy, cool seed genetics that I, you know, haven't even seen people produce in five or six years. And all these people that have these collections, and I, I want to see those come back into the light. I want people to see the amazing terpenes that they've never experienced. So... So you're right. That has to happen. I think it already is. And it's just encouraging people to collaborate and uh, and, you know, and be selfless in terms of like, let's just have more conversations like this. So there's two really firm strategies and two things we need to be absolutely mindful of, in my opinion. First and foremost, the reason the Appalachian Law notes varietal is because the intention is to document, catalog and snapshot where we are now in the public record. That is a public asset you can't undo that document and library except sort of maybe eleanor you might correct me which okay um so first and foremost public if it is a public institution it is for the public benefit um, secondly, ownership and control, how the company is structured. A private company can and will liquidate assets. If you, the farmers, don't own the company in part, it's probably not going to have your interests in heart at the end of the day. And so obviously the farmers don't have the capital. Structuring partnerships very, very carefully between farmer and financer is the way to move forward. But if the bottom line communal farmer ownership doesn't exist, it's probably not a good strategy. So public ownership, farmer ownership, cooperative shared ownership are, are very important strategies and structures to, to really like trust at the end of the day, back it up. And, and then you want recognition because when what you give us extractor, everybody in the industry, what we receive, we owe it to you. If you don't receive credit for what you give us, it doesn't work. You need to be able to create a market where 
the credit is given back to the origin of the product. And most extractors, if you do a web pen, and yeah, you want to do big number, but when you buy your biomass in Salinas, or when you buy your biomass in Mando or Humboldt, it's not quite the same. It's not quite the same biomass. And because you have a world recognition, you have to work this. You, the world know that you grow the best. You, you need to be aware of that when you sell your product. Already you sell it too cheap. <laughs> but on top of it, they don't give you credit for the quality that they recognize for. It's like you need at least to ask for your name on the packaging. You don't care if it's a weapon, you don't care if it's a chocolate, you don't care whatever. It comes from your farm. And that name on the packaging is actually a promotion and a marketing worldwide power for all those companies that feed on you. So it's like, it's, you need to protect yourself, but you need to be aware of the value of what you protect and there is no deal that not gi doesn't give you credit back because the you're, breeder, the, you're, you're the center of that new industry uh, being the, born. The breeder and the grower need to become the brand. I really believe the that. Origin, the origin, the land, it's the land. It's like the, the whole uh, life giver and life nourishing are the land and the climate. We coexist with them and can create something that is different and better than others. It's all the origin. We are just visitors. But when you, when you buy a great cheese, a great wine, any great agricultural product, it's that place. Because that's, your, that's the amazing value of it. That whole living soil and being in osmosis where what you live, that's what really makes quality that you cannot duplicate. Alec. So, the just real quick. Oh. I think the biggest advantage that anybody has in the whole industry is like, you know, protecting, like recognizing what is so sacred and cherished with Northern California. Just, uh, that's the plant, the, 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 the escape from the chemical paradigm to come to the clean and clean medicine. Shared practices. That's, it's in the statute. Yeah. Um, we have another panel coming up in two minutes. Oh. So we're going to have to wrap this. I really thank everyone for oh, spending the extra good. time to have the conversation. Let's give a big round. Thank you. Hey. Anyway, lastly, I, I did bring some seeds to gift to some folks. I didn't bring enough for everybody, but I have some some seeds from my collection. I'll just leave them here if anybody wants to, some, some free seeds as a gift for showing up and 